And we're back. And we're back. And we're back. And we're back. With more of the Pope on film. Did you see I, what I did there? Did, did you see what he, I did oh, there? yeah. No, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Yeah, it it's a, like it the opening. A, a multi dimensional opening. Yeah, yes. I gotcha. I, I thought you were just doing that because you're high. That was that was a wear back from several different universes. I see that. Whoa, dogs, chill out. Maybe close that door. Um, here's the thing about Oklahoma: if you don't have a dog and you want one, just just keep the door open, and some mutt will just wa wander into your house eventually. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what they're barking at either. You, yes, Mal? Do you have something? Okay, hold on. My 17-year-old uh, son has something. Hoity Toity is believed to have been created as a rhyme based on the dialectal English word hoit, meaning to play the fool. Hoity Toity can mean foolish, but it is most often referred to, you know, like, used as uh, pretentious. Wow! Uh, wow. Nice. Good job. Way to tie. You know, uh, what you just did is like a rug. It really tied the podcast together. I don't know what just happened. I found the culprit. Is is that a uh, Robin in there, or what? What's what are you showing me? Oh yeah, that's that's. There you are. Hi, Robin. It's Robin the dog, the new star of the Pope on Phil. I haven't even done the intro yet. Everything <laughs> everywhere. Oh. It's, you, you, no. it, this is a real loosey goosey episode. That's okay because everywhere, everything, all at once. Nope, that's not the way it is. Everything, everything everything, everywhere, everywhere, all, everywhere, all, everywhere. Everything, everywhere. Wah, 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 wah. Oh, finally, the transition to Peanuts Parent. <laughs> <laughs> everything, <laughs> everywhere, all at once. Fuck off. You just it's gave me a big a Mrs. Othmar vibes. Dude. That was Linus's teacher, Mrs. Othmar. I love this dog. Uh, it's time, buddy! It's time. It's time. Yes, it's time. bunny! Yes, bunny, my friend! It is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast to shimmy our way into the second act of our big shoe, and it is said second act, wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all-new extra-strength concentrated professional grade guaranteed to cut through those tough kitchen stains. Movie of the week! And this week we continue, we finish our celebration of one very important half of this podcast, Mr. Bonnie Williams, with a star-studded Buntober of films. And yeah, it's November, but what are we going to watch? Planes, trains, and automobiles? What other Thanksgiving movies really are there? Yeah. Period. It's shocking. The, the Thanksgiving series. Yeah, but other than that, that's that's not... I personally think that someone should make a low-budget Halloween ripoff for every other freaking holiday. Period. I want to see Guy Fox Day. Yeah. The new horror film from Bunny Williams. You know, every holiday should get one. Yes. St. Patrick's Death. Well, Day. it was looking like it for back in the 80s, man, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. This week, we'll be getting deep AF with a very metaphysical look at 2022 straight-up masterpiece. Everything, everywhere, all at once! No, I have a, I have a lot to say about this, about this movie. And Good. later, we will be getting crazy deep about this movie and the themes of it. But before we get into it, I want to talk about Doctor Strange. Okay. When they announced that title, 
Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness? Oh, I, I near, I doth shat myself yes. with excitement. Oh, finally, the multiverse, different universes, different characters. There's going to be so many fun multiverses, so many different versions of, of the, the characters that you know and love. And remember, there were talks of like a Tom Cruise as Iron Man. Yeah. And all of these different, maybe they could even bring Robert Downey Jr. back. And, you know, this was back during those days where it's like, OK, so uh, for two seconds in this one scene of a Marvel movie, you see something red. Mephisto confirmed. Yes. I hope that I hope that uh, society doesn't forget that period in time when move Marvel fans were seeing Mephisto everywhere. Yes. So uh, I was so excited. Oh. So many multiverses. And when I first saw Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, I liked it. Because it was trying to be something different. It was a Marvel movie. It was a comic book movie. It was also very much a Sam Raimi film. And there were some horror parts to it. And it was uh, some surprising gore parts. I'm surprised at, at the things they got away with doing to the Illuminati in a PG-13 film. But, um, the more I watch Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, the more disappointed I am in the film. Yeah. Because it's like, like, I've watched it like four times now, and each time there's just something different that just like, it's like, oh, wait a second. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Oh, you mean the, what, two multiverses in the whole film? <laughs> if you don't count the, like, multiverse montage where they're, like, falling and you see, like, 20 different ones. Other yeah. than that, there's only, like, two or three different multiverses in the whole film. Yeah. And that's it. And it's, like, that's... It, it's kind of... It's kind of sad when your film is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and there's more multiversal madness in the movie with Spider-Ham. Yes. Yes. At, there's at more point. There's and, more and multi all it, of the variants for Doctor Strange. Yeah. At, at which causes a bit of a problem. Why weren't the variants cast different, like in Loki and like in Spider Man? Yeah, it's it's because yeah. I really wanted to see a David Schwimmer Doctor Strange. Ooh, yeah. Trying to get the right lighting. Uh, if you're listening to this, you have no idea what's going on. I'm just going to leave it like a bright, shining mess. Uh, and then it's like, oh, OK, like I see it a, a, a yet another time. And it's like, oh, well. You know, the big reveal of the Illuminati, that's like freaking epic. But then I realize, like, I see it like a like a third time, a fourth time. I see it a fourth time and it's like. Wait a second, I'm only watching this film for a for a reveal of like five characters that will die five minutes later. Yes. I was hoping for the whole movie to be like that, but it's just one scene in the middle of the film, which is the great part of the movie, and everything else is like and then it and then it's like, oh, Scarlet Witch is going to co-star in it, and she's going to be there's a chance she might be the bad guy and it's going to be like, a, oh, oh, then I better watch WandaVision again. And it's like, I didn't have to watch WandaVision. No. I love WandaVision. I didn't have to watch WandaVision. No. And it's like, so the only thing about Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness that I like is that I like the Illuminati, and I like the fact. Have you seen that video of the background actress 
in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Have you seen that? No. When Doctor Strange goes into the wedding and he sits down and there's another doctor from the first film that sits down next right. to him and they have a conversation. Watch that scene. It's the best part of the movie. Right behind Doctor Strange's head is an old white woman and they obviously said, okay, look, be really excited. And she is just the worst extra ever in the history of extras. Because here's this a uh, serious scene happening but if you just focus your eyes just an inch to the right you just see this woman overacting <laughs> like crazy yeah and it, if you're listening to this I apologize but if you're watching it basically the, the old lady behind Doctor Strange is like this huh 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 it's Freaking hilarious. It is hilarious. It's the best part of the film. Really, and like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. The best part about it is the Illuminati, one really horrible extra, and the fact that the car is in it. Yeah. The car from the Evil Dead and the car from Spider Man, the car from Dark Man, it's also in this. That's the only. Thing that I like about it. Period. <laughs> I like the fact that, like, one of the heroes, one of the central main characters is a Mexican woman, and I know that pissed people off. Yes. But I don't particularly like the film because I wanted a multiverse of madness. And if you want to see a multiverse of madness, watch this week's film and not the film titled Multiverse of Madness. Yeah. I, I, I liked it, but I, I felt let down by it. Yeah. And it's like, oh my god, look at look at all these characters that we've introduced. Okay, well, they're dead in five, six minutes, so what is the point? That just means it's just fan service. Like, yeah. Yeah, and that, that annoyed to, me. I mean, you're, yeah, I mean, you're just teasing us. You could spend more time on the actual plot of this movie. The one we're actually watching, not the Illuminati movie. I, I see the bug. Can you keep it away from me, though? It's creepy. Okay, I don't like it. This is exactly how you were when we were in California. Look at this thing I found. No. No. It's a little, it's a little guy. You can't see that one, but it's, it's, a, little, it's a little isopod. It's a little isopod. Are those those things you put in your shoes and they make them comfy, honey? Isopods? No. I need to get me a pair of isopods. Oh, isotoners. Oh, those are the gloves. Those are the, those gloves. Are the gloves. Okay. Thinking of Dr. Scholes. Um, Dr. Scholes, good doctor. Not as good as Dr. James H. Salisbury. Oh. No. So, um, Bunny, I effing love this movie so much. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I love this movie so much. I know so many little facts about this film. Like the voice of Rakakuni, that is Randy Newman. Is he it? went uncredited. Yeah, he wrote a he wrote a parody to his own song and sung it in this film. But he didn't want to raise the ire of Disney, so he went uncredited. But that is him as the voice of Rakakuni. And that is an, an Oscar award-winning songwriter who, who wrote that song for this tiny little throwaway gag in Everything Everywhere All at Once. I love that. Yes. That is awesome. They made fake, beautiful fake movie posters for all of the different main universes. They made a beautiful Rakakuni poster. They made a poster for the um, for the film that they're watching in the movie theater. They made a film for the two rocks, <laughs> and it's like it, like um, the thing about this film is, I I I really find myself loving movies that are different. I yeah. drove forty five minutes away to see Lamb. There was only one other person oh, in the okay. theater. You, you might need 
a little counseling on that. Okay. I, I mean, loved that I mean, movie. But to drive 45 minutes. Yeah. I you, drove can, 30, you can love it. Minutes. You can rent it. <laughs> and then and then I drove over a, an hour to see the lighthouse. And that was crazy. And it's like Hey, it's okay. We've all been there where we've driven a long way to another city to watch a Rob Pattinson film. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Fucking. I think that 9 uh, 11 should become movie. Robert Pattinson Day. Um, no, I, I know. I know. I've moved on to another Robert Pattinson movie. I say Ro that 9 11 should be Pattinson yes. Day, where we remember, where we take the time to, to mourn those that we lost and also celebrate the stupidest twist ending in the history of movies. Yes. Oh my god, look at look at this freaking Bruce Wayne is an uggo. You see that, bunny? <laughs> Ugh. Here, here, here. That is hit. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Go back to Riverdale. He always looks like he needs more sleep. <laughs> he always yes. looks like he needs more sleep. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but fucking. Oh. From the lighthouse on, I don't hate this man anymore, and he can do no wrong by me. I mean, I've I love this man. I, I absolutely just, I, I wasn't. I laughed fan him of off. The lack of emotion of Bella Swan, what's her name? But then she came out and like she is shining bright. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, girl, you live your you should, self, and look at you, fucking glow. You should see. You should. You should, with an open mind, see the the Charlie's Angels reboot with her in it. She's the funny one, and her kind of whole bit is that she's the funny one, but also she's a little bit of a horn dog to men and women. Primarily, she pretends to be a horn dog to the men, and she kind of hits on all the women. And it's just she is the bright spot of an otherwise pretty shitty movie. But it's like I love her in that. And it's Are like, oh, shit, fun? you're having fun. Look at you actually having fun in a movie. You can do that. That's you're allowed. Like, yeah. I, I, I... Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, so... for Kristen Stewart, the one that did it for me was when I saw her in, in American Ultra. That is such a fun movie for an actor. I don't think I've, I don't think I've seen that. Have I seen that? I don't it's, think I've uh... seen that. It's it's Jesse Eisenberg and he's okay. He's yeah, a that burnt movie. out teen, you know. He yeah. does mushrooms and gets high with his girlfriend, and he wants to draw comic books. And then somebody walks into Seven Eleven he works at and says the super secret soldier code, just like they did with Bucky. Yeah, longing, rusted. And he and he activates, and Kristen Stewart was his girlfriend, and it it's a fun action movie. Okay, in my mind, it's a sequel to Adventureland. Because hmm. weren't they both in that as well? And by the end of it, they're dating. I don't. I I haven't seen Adventureland. Wait, what, what, what did? Jesse Eisenberg. I think so. And Kristen Stewart. Yeah, no, they were both working at the theme park in Adventureland. I liked that movie because it was filmed at Kennywood. And I've told this story on the podcast before. One day I was sick and I was told that I had to stay in bed and watch TV. So I turned it on PBS and managed to catch a two hour documentary about a very old park in Pennsylvania called Kennywood. And the thing was, was that all of the teens would say, whenever your zipper was down, Kennywood's yeah. open. And we still say that to this day. Yeah. My wife and I, oh, shit, Kennywood's open. Zip. And so I saw Adventureland only because, like, oh, Kristen Stewart's in this. But it was filmed in Kennywood. And I've been obsessed with that since I got the flu when I was nine. So, yeah, they're, they're, they were... Boyfriend and girlfriend in two movies. That's fascinating. So I love. So okay. So I hey, will. Kristen Stewart do some action scenes. Does she do some ag in American Ultra? 
she kicks ass in uh, uh, Charlie's Angels. Okay. What yeah. About, what about she? She totally about? kicks ass in American Ultra. Yeah, yeah that's nice. awesome. Okay, all right. That's yeah. awesome. That's cool. Funny. So throughout the year, I will obsessively write and rewrite and re rewrite and hastily scribble my own personal list of my favorite films of the year. Every year, what I look for is I want the number one film to be my Midsommar for the year. The movie that I watch and become obsessed with and force other people in the house to watch and I a movie I fall in love with and in this year of our Lord 2022 I said this earlier in the podcast that I love everything everywhere all at once and also it kind of pisses me off because there have been a handful of movies that in any other year that everything everywhere all at once hasn't come out in that those movies could very well take the top spot if it were not for everything everywhere all at once Marcel the shell with shoes on it's a PG rated kids movie from A24. It is hilarious and funny and adorable, and I love it. It would be number one. Every, but everything, everywhere, all at once had to blow my freaking mind. There's another film called Brian and Charles. Okay. It's a very low budget foreign film about a guy, and he has a shed. And he's always trying to build things and they're always unsuccessful. And then one day he decides to build a robot and it works perfectly and it's AI. And uh, the robot it comes up with his own name. I am Charles Petrescu. And it's so stupid and cute and lovable. And oh my God, I love it. That could be number one. Everything Everywhere All at Once had to come in. I really like Nope. And a lot of people don't like this film. I really love Don't Worry Darling. I love that movie. I might have to give it another watch. A lot of you people know. hate it. I freaking love it. From the beginning, I knew what was up. In the beginning of Don't Worry Darling, I knew what was up because it's like, wait a second, I'm a minority. You mean to tell me that this is supposed to be, what, the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and yet there's a white woman and a black woman, and there's like a Freaking uh, Pakistani dude with a white woman. Um, me thinks this might not be the nineteen fucking fifties, but um, and weird, the weird Al Yankovic movie. Yes, but this week's movie, it's my Midsommar. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Fucking love this movie, hands down. Best film of the year. The script, the characters, the effects, the quotable lines, the believable acting. The, and then at the center of it is such a sweet story. He was short round in Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. Yes. Then he was he was data in the Goonies. And for people of a certain age, he was just their childhood. He was their growing up. These two movies were just such powerhouses. But then he couldn't he find on a acting. sitcom for a while. I probably. But then he couldn't get work because they he just didn't see work for Asians. So he gave up being an actor. And he wanted to be an actor, but he gave up. And it wasn't until he was much, much older that the movie Crazy Rich Asians came out. And he said, Oh my goodness, I think they're actually giving uh acting roles to Asian people. Maybe I should try an audition. And what's the first film he gets in? This! And it's perfect for him! Yeah. And I love him! And he is the heart of this film and the center of it. And I just relate to him so much because oftentimes in relationships, there's the one who might be a bit more serious and a bit uh, more um, rational. And then there's uh, the person who's who a lot of times I feel like my job is just to make people laugh. You know? What she's saying is there's a lot of mirrors that she's seeing to her own life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I relate to that. 
So, yeah, I deeply relate to that film and to this film and his character and just all of it. And I honestly hope he gets nominated for something. I, I think he's fantastic. he's fantastic in this. Oh god, they really all he's so that. believable That's when funny. he's in that elevator and he does the change like oh right yeah. there you can it that's great acting yeah. you know absolutely i really think he's got a chance to be yeah. nominated i i have to pick up my daughter for jobu tapaki jobu tapaki i changed my name on twitter to the trans jobu tapaki for a while jobu it's funny because i think you're not doing it on purpose, but that's what she does throughout the entire thing. She doesn't get the name right until the end. Jo Jobu Tapaki. Juju Chewbacca. Did I get it? Wait, say it again. Jo Jobu Tapaki. Nailed it. Did I? Yes. Good job. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Uh, and Natasha has seen it. Mal has seen it. Seen Max it saw it. Theater. Yeah. Right yeah. I have. And we had a date the, night. It was the one with the creators, like in oh yes, we went to go see uh, like a the a movie ball. came out in theaters and then it left and then it came back in theaters with uh there was a special introduction by the directors and then at the end they showed bloopers. Yeah, yeah, that was. Cool. And it was so cute, and they were the the two directors were talking at the people in the audience, and the first time I went to go see it. Uh, with the director opening, he's there like, "Hey, why don't all of you in the theater? Why don't you uh, just just call out how many times you've seen the movie?" And just me being me, I just went, "This is my fourth." And and the directors are like, "Oh wow, hey, that's a lot." And then some guy behind me went, "Have you really seen this four times?" Yeah, this is my fourth, and we're just talking. In the middle of the introduction, it was so sweet. <laughs> and I went to the movies with a googly eye in the middle of my forehead and the 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 you know the the people working at the snack bar at the ticket counter, they're just like low paid people who hate movies and they're like, uh, which film are you watching? And I'm like, Do you see the do you see the googly eye on my forehead? Obviously, obviously, I'm here to see Minions, The Rise of Gru. Oh. Are um, we going to have to restart this? Because we've barely even started talking about the movie yet. And we're at the 10-minute warning. I think we probably do. I mean, you do yeah. have a lot to say about I this. I do have a lot more to say about this. I have this is a, one of your like, favorites. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. I still have to do a... Uh, 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 shout out to one of my favorite actors who's in this. We haven't even gotten to the plot, and I have some real deep shit to get into about this film. So, no, we do have to restart this. Okay, so let's run out to 10 minutes and we'll just restart it again. Okay. So. Oh, wow. I was just raising my arm. Okay. So, I, I want to do a salute, if I may, to. Uh, one of my favorite people in this film, because as anyone who has listened to this podcast for more than five seconds probably knows, the greatest television show of all time is I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson on Netflix. It's been on for two seasons, and it is my entire life. It's really great because I'm obsessed with it, but unlike a lot of other things that I became hyper fixated on, like cheap seats without Ron Parker and Syphil and Ali and Clone High. Uh, there is a huge fandom for I Think You Should Leave, and it's really surprising. Uh, there's a One of my uh, biggest supporters on Twitter is a guy named Carl Havoc. So really happy about that. I'm currently being followed on Instagram and Twitter by I Think You Should Leave memes. That's a big get for me. So okay. I, I freaked the F out. When uh, actor Biff Wick appeared on screen, who plays 
Santa Claus and Detective Crashmore in two back-to-back skits in season two of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. I had no clue that an actor from I Think You Should Leave was in this. I got as excited as I did when I saw um, the Thank You Spider-Man guy in the preview for Ant-Man Quantumania. Because that guy is uh, in one of my favorite skits from I Think You Should Leave. He's the guy who wants a good steering wheel that doesn't whiff out of the window while I'm driving. So Biff (laughs) Whiff is Biff Whiff played Santa Claus and Detective Crashmore in two back to back skits in season two of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. He is the old guy whose wife used to wear the same perfume. The old guy who dances with Waymond in the laundromat. Okay. And uh, it's just really great that this guy who was in, whose only claim to fame was one bizarre, two bizarre little skits on this show I'm obsessed with, is suddenly a small character in this major film. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, I'd like to give a salute to actress Jenny Slate. I think it's vaguely racist that uh, Evelyn calls her big nose in this film. She is Jewish. It is kind of dicey to call her big nose throughout this film, but yeah, uh, that's actress Jenny Slate. She was a uh, f- also featuring on <laughs> SNL until she accidentally said the F word live on air and they fired her shortly after that. The F word. She was doing a skit with Kristen Wiig, and the whole thing were they were just saying frickin' the whole time. Hey, frickin', we're gonna frickin' get wasted tonight. We're gonna frickin' have so much fun. It's frickin' gonna be you and frickin' me. And let me tell you something. I fucking love you. And and just hurt the look on her face afterwards. She was just She knew her time was up after that. And I felt really bad for her, but she's also uh, Mona Lisa Saperstein in Parks and Recreation. She is the unicorn floating head in Star vs. the Forces of Evil. She is the cute dog uh, in The Cute White Dog, love interest in The Secret Life of Pets, and she is the co-creator and co-writer and vocal star of the number two movie, favorite movie of mine this year, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. (laughs) So Jenny Slate was co-starring in my number one film and created the second film. So good for you, Jenny Slate. That is awesome. She is amazing. You really should see. I uh And who was she? She was the girlfriend? No, no, she was the uh, she was the one with the big nose. She was the one with the dog that she used as a weapon. Okay, that's Jenny Slate. She also did some really great uh, drunk histories. Uh, but yeah, my two favorite people in this film, Jenny Slate. I get excited every time I see her. Uh, don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. And uh, Biff Whiff. A.K.A. Santa Claus from Detective Crashmore. I'm so excited about that. Rewatching this as many times as I have, one of the things I like to do now when I watch this film is see how many circles are hidden in this film. Really? There are so many hidden in this film. Like in the beginning, you're focusing in on a mirror, and that's the circle. and it, it it's it's supposed to just be like uh you know like the everything bagel there are circles everywhere throughout this entire film and when you realize that and you look at it it becomes like a freaking where's waldo like oh yeah there's one behind her there there oh there's one there too and it's just this like nice foreshadowing throughout the entire film that there are all of these circles that are right there in your face I really like it. You know, originally this movie was supposed to have a male star and they were trying to get Jackie Chan. Really? But Jackie Chan said, no, uh, I'm not doing it. So they rewrote it to be a woman and they got her to be in it. And the first thing that she did was uh, call her good friend Jackie Chan and make fun of him. 
for not taking nice. the movie. Nice. And it's like, good for you. Good for you. She is awesome. I feel really bad because um, uh, my kids sometimes like to watch the second Minions movie, which came out this summer, Minions Rise of Gru. And she, Evelyn is in Minions Rise of Gru. And I always get, and I got excited. I went to go see it in the movie, and it's like, oh my God, Evelyn is in this. Evelyn from Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh, this is going to be awesome. Oh, wait. She's an old woman who's also a kung fu master who teaches them kung fu. We need to be fucking racist, minions. <laughs> you got Evelyn and you wasted her for a racist part in your animated movie. Oh, F off, minions. That pisses me off. You go from everything, everywhere, all at once to freaking minions movie. Oh, yeah. that upsets me. But also, it's not the movie maker's fault because uh, the Minions movie got new mutanted. The Minions 2 coming yes. out summer 2020 unless an act of God happens, but that won't happen. So it came out summer 2022 and it's like, oh, so you were working on this film before she got the part in everything, everywhere, all at once. But it took longer anyway. Uh, so we still have a lot. We don't have a lot to talk about, but we do need to get a little bit deeper into this film. And I want to talk a little bit about the plot. Yeah. But before we do that, we are doing this show on Zoom and we have less than a minute left. So let's just run it through real quick and be right back. Okay. Yes, we will be right back. And cut. Hey, guy. I think social security should be uh, privatized. You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. I will take over start time. Not if I have anything to say about it, Skeletor. We will fight to the death. Or, gentlemen, may I suggest a second option? What if we all enjoy the great taste of sugar crisp? Can't get enough of that sugar crisp, sugar crisp. And we're back, yada yada go. Okay. Uh I, I I would like to take this time to say that I am super high right now, legally. Yes. Because I am in a state with medicinal marijuana and I have a licensed card. <laughs> don't smoke marijuana unless it's legal, kids. Yeah. I don't yeah. smoke it because of the asthma. And also, did you know that vaping can can del can uh <laughs> deliver co toxic metals into your lungs? That's metal in your lungs. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I am legally high right now. My, this was my to-do list. This was my to-do list today. Um, go to church, finish writing podcast, record podcast, get really high and listen to Chuck Mangione. Uh, no. I freaking love his music so much. Uh -huh. I know that this isn't the most popular thing in the world to hear someone say. I am in love with the smooth jazz of Chuck Mangione. I am obsessed with it. Really? The thing is, is that um, I'm in this group and it's uh, 
you know you grew up in Phoenix, Arizona in the 80s when? And I was uh, finding all of these old uh, 1980s uh, news broadcasts on YouTube. So I took a few screenshots of different news broadcasts from Phoenix, Arizona in the 80s, and I posted them on the Facebook group. And a bunch of people were like, oh, my God, that's uh, Frank Camacho and that's Liz Turley. And, and oh, is, that's back when the weatherman was this guy. And, oh, Dewey Hopper was on the was in the helicopter. And everyone's talking about all of these memories. And somebody says, oh, yes, that the first one is from Channel 5. I remember they would always sign out with the song Balavia by Chuck Mangione. And I immediately went, Chuck Mangione? The fucking guy who died in King of the Hill? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so I said, I didn't know that Chuck Mangione provided the end credit music of the news in the 80s, but I'm going to find the song and listen to it, but it, I probably don't recognize it. So I press play, and I'm like, it's a pretty song, but it's not doing anything for me. And the song keeps playing, and I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty song, but I don't recognize it. And then the song keeps going. It's like, yeah, this is a nice song, but it, it's not really, you know, triggering anything. And then it, and then the song gets to a loud flourish. And I swear to God, I was an eight-year-old kid in my parents' kitchen eating dinner and watching the goddamn news. Oh, wow. I could see, perfectly see the end credits of channel KPHO TV 5 Phoenix 6 o'clock news broadcast. I was a kid again, and I heard it, and I realized that, like, it, it's weird to explain, but I was, a, I was a very young child in the 1980s, so I don't know what it was like to be an adult in Phoenix, Arizona in the 80s, but Chuck Mangione's music sounds like how it felt to be an adult in Phoenix in the 80s. Okay. If you want to know what it was like to be an adult in Phoenix in the 1980s, make everything in your house brown and wood, s s blow a lot of cigarette smoke in the air, and listen to Chuck Mangione. <laughs> okay. While drinking a tab. It, it, I'm not sure why, but but ever since I figured that out about uh, Chuck Mangione and the news broadcast, uh, his music like deeply touches my soul, and I am listening to him a lot. A really? lot. Yes, I am surprised. It's just, it's I don't know. It, it's just my thing. I freaking love it. But I've so, never so, listened to him while high, so this is my plan, is to legally get high and then sit in my bedroom listening to Chuck Mangione and just seeing where it takes my soul. But have you but, started drinking the unsweetened tea yet? No. No, okay. I have not. Funny. Can you hit us with the plot of this week's film? No, this will be his biggest challenge yet. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh... Yeah, no. Uh, she kind of goes through a journey uh, to realize that nothing really matters, basically, and this could possibly be all manifestations of her nervous breakdown if we are taking the opening personality as the primary personality yeah she was really fucking high strong can i can i can i pause you there and move on to another film really quick sure okay i think i Fixed hereditary. Okay. okay. I'm going to explain to you what I think the movie is about. The movie goes into great lengths to show that Tony Collette's mother, 
character, her, her the character she plays works with miniatures. Oh, it, she works into such fine details, and she works so on it's on the minutest detail and makes sure that everything looks perfect down to the last tiny detail. So she's very controlling. She's controlling everything. And I was wondering, like, why is there such a focus on the miniatures? What does that have to do with the film at large? I think, because you said, and a lot of other people have said, it's two movies. It's this drama about a family, and then there is a specific breakoff where it becomes a completely different film. Like from yes. Dust Till Dawn. Mm, like a, similar, yes. In the sense that uh, uh, Quinn Tarantino and... Uh, Robert Rodriguez were talking about the film and and uh, Robert Rodriguez said it's a crime film. It is a uh, a very serious crime film until you get to page 70. And believe me when I say when you are watching the film you know when page, when you get to page 70. Yes. And that's the same thing with 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 uh, Hereditary. You're watching this like drama about a family and then suddenly, oh shit, it's page 70, y'all. Yes. So I was trying to figure out why. So then I thought, okay, this is a very controlling woman who works in miniatures because she wants to get every minute detail of her life right. And then her mother died. Okay. So maybe, but she's still trying to keep everything uh, in control because she's a very controlling person. And then. Uh, the daughter gets beheaded and that's when everything changes. I think she had a breakdown and the reason why the page 70 happens in the film is because from that point on she's telling you what she thinks is happening. But she actually kills her husband and then kills herself but the second half of the film is us going into her brain and her telling us what she thinks is going on. Okay. Just like the miniatures. There are scenes where you are looking at her miniature and she's working on a miniature and then suddenly it zooms in and oh wait, it's not a miniature. Now we're in real life. It's because she controls everything. She controls everything. And she makes all of the scenes in her life into these tiny little miniatures. And then sometimes you go into them and you see them in detail because she controls everything. The break that happens, the, to use a, a From Dust Till Dawn descriptor, the page 70 happens in Hereditary because there is a part where we are being told by an unreliable narrator how she is processing the horrible things that are happening she is having a breakdown and she is telling us what she thinks is real which is a fake she kills her husband then kills herself then imagines a world where her only remaining living family member is worshipped as a god okay I this is my uh, game theory for the movie and I think it's freaking perfect. And it makes the film better and it explains it more because you're like, oh, this is a really like serious drama about a family coming apart. Yeah. Then suddenly it's witches and shit. This is the reason why. My theory fixes hereditary. Okay. I might have I to watched... watch it again, find it yeah, somewhere. Exa I've watched the film a couple of times, but once I came up with this realization, I watched it another time, and it became one of my favorite movies. Really? Okay. Yes, and I've been meaning to tell you this for like a couple of months, and I forgot until you were talking about uh, whether or not uh, Evelyn is having a nervous breakdown. Yes. Also in the A24 universe... Uh, both films, Hereditary and Everything Everywhere All at Once. I'm so proud of the fact that, like, Everything Every uh, a this is an A24 film. A24 is like the shit right now for film n nerds, and 
they've released so many big time films and Oscar nominated films and uh, the film that made people the last film to make people say Oscar contender uh, Adam Sandler <laughs> And they released uh, Midsommar, and they released all of these films, uh, mid-90s, uh, Moonlight, I think. Uh, but everything, everywhere, all at once, their highest grossing film of all time. And that's so wonderful. This movie deserves it, and I love this film. And I love the fact that like, a lot of times when I'm watching a movie... And it's like a bad movie. And I look at the credits and there's all these names and I wonder like. I wonder if just five people made this movie. Yeah. Sometimes you're watching a film like Virus Shark and you're like. Are these names in the credits real? Or did 10 people make this entire film and we're just seeing some fake credits? So I really like the fact that when Everything Everywhere All at Once was was slowly expanding to becoming this big uh, Hollywood hit, that the filmmakers were honest in saying all of the special effects were just five dudes. Yeah. It was just five guys just winging it, seeing what we could do what we could get away with. And it's like, oh, that's so honest. Freaking good for you, you know? <laughs> good for you. Yeah. I think it's an amazing film. It's garnering so much attention. We had lists, huh, not lists, items. For Gish. For Gish? For Gish. Yes. The greatest international Gish. scavenger hunt? Yes. Yes. And that were based on everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So be proud of the fact that only five dudes made this. And it's awesome. <laughs> or the effects anyway. Before I saw the film, I was on Instagram and I saw a, a picture of uh, like uh, it, it was a post by Weird Al Yankovic. And he said, I just saw everything everywhere all at once. And you should watch it, too. And it, it's a picture of him and Jamie Lee Curtis with hot dogs for fingers. And I went. What the fuck is this movie that <laughs> Laurie Strode and Weird Al Yankovic are in this photograph with hot dogs for hands? I need to see this film. And I'm glad that I did. I saw it five times in theaters. I, I, I originally saw it. I saw it four times and I said, OK, that's that's good. But then I went, oh, shit. I saw cats four times in theaters. Yes, you did. I have to see everything everywhere all at once more times than magical Mr. Mistopolis. Yes. I, I, I feel bad that I enjoyed watching Jamie Lee Curtis get punched so much. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Did you, so did you see Halloween ends? No, no. Okay. Um, did you see any of the new Halloween movies? I, I saw the one before this accidentally because I. Oh, was it this time last year? It was probably this time last year. And I picked up Peacock so I could watch the parade. And it was just sitting there, the Halloween movie. So I was like, well, fuck it. I guess I have to watch it. Yeah. I wasn't a fan. Um. I I really want you to see the last one Halloween ends because other people aren't reacting when I say one of the main characters was Walter Paisley. Okay. That they literally just got Walter Paisley and airdropped him into the middle of the last Halloween movie for no effing reason whatsoever and it pisses me off and I put that on Twitter and I put that on freaking Facebook whatever nobody has any freaking idea what I'm talking about but there is a serious Walter Paisley bucket of blood motherfucker in the middle of that movie okay right in the middle airdropped into the middle of it operation dumbo dropped into the middle of Halloween <laughs> funny 
And it was nice to see that, at least in some universe, she was able to heal her differences with Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. And do it. Yes. Every time that... uh, I, I know my wife wants to have uh, relations with me when she hits her fingers against her legs like this. That's the official way that you let someone know that you want to have relations with them. Okay. Is that hitting? They do that. They do that in the film and in the film within the film. There, there's a lot of levels to this film and I love it. Bunny, I want to get deep about this movie. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ever since I was a kid, this is a great conversation to have while I'm high, legally high. Um, ever since I was a kid, I have always won. I have always felt that there were other me's out there that were kind of nearby, that were living my life, but slightly different. And I, ever since I was a very young child, I thought about this. And then I finally saw something that, that helped me process and understand what I was thinking. Okay, my life is a choose-your-own-adventure novel. And so I'm making decisions, but there are all of these other decisions that are also near me, but I don't know what's happening to them because I've made these one specific decisions. Right. And so I always saw my life as a sort of choose your own adventure novel. And then when I like when I was in my early 20s, I got a copy of a science magazine and it talked about how scientists believe that there are an infinite number of alternate universes that are around us at any time that we can't see because we are locked in our own universe of possibilities, but we should also realize that around us are an infinite number of alternate possibilities. And I said, oh my goodness, this is a scientific theory that backs up what I have always felt since I was a child, but but yes, an alternate Num an infinite number of alternate universes surrounding us at all times that feature all of the other possible outcomes of our life. And so I have always felt that. And and what I'm trying to say is basically the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once is a documentary. Okay. Rowdy Roddy Piper would <laughs> said the same thing about They Live. He, and he would say in interviews, that movie is true. That movie is real life. I wasn't in a science fiction film. I was in a documentary. Okay. So. Okay. Yes. Hit me. I've had the story run in my head for years. Okay. Where you marry science and magic because they do they have to do ritualistic things. Mm -hmm. in order to access this but they're also using science and technology that was my story and about how many lives you actually have out there i i just it blew my mind when i saw it I'm like, this is it now i'm done i don't yeah. not, i don't have to worry about writing it because huh. he wrote it for me yeah. it was great and they did some such a better job than i probably ever could have so yeah. like Yes. Yeah. I love when that happens because writers, we don't want to write this shit. Okay. Yeah. We don't. We want to read it, but nobody's fucking writing it. So when this shit happens, it's like fucking score. Yeah. Like I've always wanted, like I've always wanted to read the book, The Insiders, which is a retelling of S.E. Hinton's Outsiders from one of the rich people, the socials. Really? Yeah. The insiders. And it's the exact same story, but it's from the point of view of the rich kid who comes and has a talk with Pony Boy about, you know, the, this fight won't change anything. Greasers will still be greasers and socials will still be socials. And like he is coming out of a movie theater and sees Pony Boy get beaten up. And then he feels bad and he wants to say something, but then his other gang members show up. 
So he decides to hang back and he follows Pony Boy to his house and it's like the shitty rundown house and he feels bad. Then he goes back to his mansion with his rich ass parents and and he realizes that his life is kind of shit. And it's the same book, but from a different point of view. And I've always wanted to read that or see a movie or a play about it. I don't want to fucking write it. Yeah, oh, yeah. At all. Like yeah. That, or just a whole ass story in your head mm. that you want to read. Yeah. And it just. Yeah. I don't want to write it. Please don't make me write it. But nobody else is writing it. Mm -hmm. But then these guys wrote it. Yeah. And I'm so happy about that. And they did it great. <laughs> they did it, they it, did it great. It. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I, I, I am the. I say that everything, everywhere, all at once is a documentary because I, I've been really happy because over the past couple of years, um, so many movies and TV shows have made me sound less effing insane. Okay. Because I have always felt that we are surrounded by an infinite number of alternate universes where an infinite number of alternate possibilities happen. So we are constantly surrounded by ourselves going through the same thing slightly differently and that we are not alone because we are surrounded by ourselves. And you tell someone that in 1998 and they'll put you in an insane asylum you tell someone that now and they'll go, oh, yeah, I, I, I loved Into the Spider-Verse. I loved Loki, Doctor Strange, The One, Happy Death Day, Endgame, Coraline, Mr. Nobody, Spider-Man No Way Home, the 2009 Star Trek reboot. <laughs> like, people get it now. Yeah. yeah but you know what? You know why, oh, people get it? why do people get it now? Made it happen. Yeah. I don't think I made it happen. I think I just became, I'm aware of it. People like you. People who had this thought. People who said, holy shit, there's a thousand million, like infinite number of universes out there. Yeah. Where, like, if I step left instead of right, two different paths. I mean, we, I personally. When is Paltrow in sliding doors? That's another one. I don't think that was, I'll just say it's my Paltrow, and I think, like, pussy. Thing, right? That, that's the candle the that, that smelled like her vagina. Yeah. There you go. That's the one. But like, see. Ah! Can you hear me, Benny? I don't know if he can hear us. Hold on. Can you hear me, Benny? I'm too high to fix it. Okay. You've, you've been like really muted. Okay. Now, can you hear us? She, there we go. That's better. It's because she made this fall out. Yeah, I made the plug of the. But I'm just saying, it's like people had that same idea and they brought it to life through cinema, through books, through cinema. comics. You know what I'm saying? And so now cinema. the people who wouldn't have otherwise thought of those things are like, cool with it. They don't think you're a fucking stoner. Yeah. You should probably stop talking about those type of things. Yeah. Yeah. Before people would have seen me as a crazy stoner for talking about the reality of the multiverse that are surrounding us at all times. But the but but now thanks to movies like Everything Everywhere All at Once, I'm less crazy. But the thing is, is that I have for a very long time felt like Evelyn, because if you are aware of the multiverse surrounding you, then you live your life different. Like, okay, so I'm driving and I'm tired and I'm like, I'm going to turn. Oh, wait. And then I almost get hit by someone and I go and like normal people would go, "Ooh, that was close. And then just go about their day. But if that happens to me, I can 100 percent see the me's who aren't me. OK, I can see the me's who uh, got into a small fender bender, who got into a large fender bender who had to go to the hospital, who had to go to the hospital and were in a coma. I can see the me's that have died. I can see my family reacting to my death. I, you, when you realize that, there's an, that, that there are multiverses surrounding you, when you almost slip and you go, oh, I almost slipped. If you pay attention, you can see the use that slipped. You can see the use that slipped and dropped uh, oil on yourself. From the kitchen, you can see the use that broke your hip. You can see the use that like slipped and died. 
when you realize that there's an infinite number of yous out there, when you almost do something, you will see the yous that really did F up. And uh, I've had a rough year, but I am really happy to be the me that I am. Good. Because there are other me's that did not um, bounce out of depression as easily as I have this year. I will say that. Um, so I stand by the multiverse. And here's, a, here's another thing that I will say because I'm high. Um, if there are an infinite number of possibilities out there, every movie exists as a reality somewhere. And it sometimes sure. makes me... Sure. It sometimes makes me look at movies differently. If there's... It, it, uh, humans can't grasp the infinite, but if there's an infinite number of possibilities, whatever weird-ass dream you have tonight, that's a reality somewhere. Whatever fantasy you have of winning the lottery, oh yeah, that's somewhere. How how do we know? Into a different reality. How do we know that writers and actors and uh, screenwriters aren't? What if they're not writing and they're just tapping into the re realities of alternate dimensions that are out there? Because whatever you write, it is out there somewhere. We I'm just can't see it because we are stuck in our own this dimension. Is no crazy then believe in some motherfucker walked on water and turned it into wine and made fish and loaves like multiply for thousands of people i'm just saying like okay yeah this is more believable than that if there if there really is an infinite number of alternate realities then everything exists somewhere I, that's one thing that i liked when i first saw dr strange the multiverse of madness one thing that i liked is he said Windows or dreams into the multiverse. And it's like, bitch, I've been saying that since I was 12. Yes. Since I was 12 years old, I've been saying that. Everything you can possibly dream of is a reality somewhere if infinity is truly infinite. And so I just, I really like this movie because it helps to beautifully explain what I have felt for a very long time. So now I can tell people my theories about the my lifelong theories about the multiverse and how i have for most of my life felt like evelyn like oh man i oh i almost got hit by that guy and like oh my god i'm i am i am having a panic attack because i can see the me's who got into that accident i can see all of the alternate realities that are branching out like uh like um uh, what was it in loki deviations from the timeline Time deviations. Yeah. The chow. I remember that. I should watch that again. That was good. How crazy is it? Minute warning. Okay. It, <laughs> I'm just going to say this again. I, I said this in an other episode of the podcast. I'm going to say it again. How crazy is it that non Marvel fans know who Moon Knight, Werewolf by Night, and Jennifer Walters are? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That is Gizmo. crazy. Gizmo just found a uh, wild friend that wouldn't die reference in a SpongeBob documentary theorist podcast or YouTube video. Someone's tying together uh, SpongeBob and the brain that wouldn't die. No, just how for years scientists ask the question, blah, blah, blah. But then they use oh, a yeah. screenshot oh, from... It's a clip of the official SpongeBob documentary. And the, the literally it shows a small clip, the no audio, just you know, the visuals from the brain that wouldn't die in the in, in an official SpongeBob documentary. Wow. That's something. Yeah. One of these days I'm gonna sit Mal down and I'm gonna make I'm gonna make him sit through a double feature. The brain that wouldn't die. And the man with two brains. Oh. I tried. I watched that again recently. Uh, number one, every movie that you watch, like my official Twitter review said, uh, Halloween ends. It was really shocking when they pulled out the Mike Myers mask and it was Merv Griffin. 
Yeah. That's right up there with the ending of New Heart that like, uh, oh man, Halloween ends. Can't believe it was all just a dream. And Laurie Strode was in bed with Suzanne Plachet. <laughs> you know? Like, those two should be together. But um, I have no idea what I was saying. I'm pretty high right now. Suzanne Plachet. No, before that. Official review. Twitter. You're doing such a great dance, but if people aren't seeing it, it's a shame. Uh, what a review of a movie. No, before that, I don't remember what I was saying. It's okay. I'm pretty high. Legally. I'm pretty legally high. Saying. I'm going to go listen to Chuck Mangione after this. Oh, yeah, I'm done with all of the with all of the writing. Coraline, alternate dimension. Brain that wouldn't die. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, the man with two brains. I loved that movie when I was a kid, but watching it now, holy shit, that's a horny ass movie. I remember just hating it. I was not a fan of that movie. That was a horny ass movie. I had no clue. I loved it. I was just a big uh, Steve Martin Mark when I was a kid. I had I had some of his uh, comedy albums, and I would listen to them over and over again, and just oh, memorize them. I have some of them memorized. I, I can I, I, I liked face when he was patch? doing his stand up, and then yeah. once he started doing movies, like we. Cl- Quickly veered away from who he was, and I didn't yeah, like that. Suddenly, he became a serious actor. I wanted to see a movie about him getting small. Why did he become a serious actor, honey? Playing the same for the banjo. The banjo, yeah, the banjo. The banjo ruined him. The banjo yeah. ruined him. The banjo. Yeah. The banjo, you know what they call it? You know what they call it? The devil's squeeze box. That's what that's what they call it. That's what they call the banjo. So uh I hope that catches on. I saw UHF the day it came out in theaters as a child. And I remember thinking, this movie is wonderful. I can't wait to see the sequel. Well, apparently I can. <laughs> apparently I can wait a long ass time. But it was worth it. So so that's all I've got this week. For everything, everywhere, all at once. We got pretty deep, but thankfully, thanks to Mr. Nobody, No Way Home, The One, Coraline, Endgame, Happy Death Day, Spider-Verse, Loki, and the 2009 Star Trek reboot, and everything, everywhere, all at once, I don't sound that insane. So I'm happy about that. Next week! Two weeks from now, but we already went through that during the chat. Next week, we are starting the Christmas season! And we will be starting it with, and it's so weird to say this, but from the director of Virus Shark. Oh. And Sharkula comes Hell on the Shelf. It's about a murderous elf on the shelf that kills people. If I had known this existed when I worked in the bookstore, it would have been all I was talking about. <laughs> I was so sick of selling Elf on the Shelves and having to do an Elf on the Shelf story time every freaking year. I hated that. So I'm really excited to to start off our Christmas movie season with a murderous Elf on the Shelf. I haven't put it up yet on the Cough Cough, but I will. It's such... It's from the guy who made Virus Shark. And and what what were all those other ones? I I listed all of these ones. We had a game. Yes, okay. Zillafoot, Noah's Shark, Stay Out, Sharkenstein, Invasion of the Empire of the Apes, House Squatch, and Amityville in space. Yes. (laughs) So, like, um, so no doubt this is going to be a high-quality film. It's going to hurt. To start off, you know what other movie I was thinking of doing for Christmas? Yogi's First Christmas. <coughs> really? <coughs> Ew, it's a it's a feature length film. I remember it being on TV every Christmas. 
Now I tell the kids, like, like again, the kids don't know who Yogi is. Well, no, they do because of the cartoon Jellystone, which is basically the Avengers Endgame, but for Hanna-Barbera characters. So, yeah, no, they know who Yogi is. But, uh, yeah. So, next week, Hell on a Shelf! Very excited. Okay. Uh, uh, it's going to be horrible, and I'm really excited about it. I really, really had fun with Virus Shark. And that guy who looked like uh, there's a monster on the surf. Duke Lawson! There yes. you go, I remembered. But thank, thank goodness I write notes. So that's going to be next week. But now that I'm looking back at this week, the highs and the lows, uh, Midsommar, medicinal meat, TVs being thick boys, I gotta say, I think this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast. This has been a damn good episode of the podcast. Okay, good. I I also felt like it was a good episode of the podcast, but I didn't want to say it because I feel like you're the person who makes the decision as to whether or not it's uh, just good or damn good. So, but 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 yes, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am May Lin. And on behalf of Natasha and Mal and everybody else in the house, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will stop upsetting your little sister. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you douche waffles and poopy tits. And you bagels. Uh, to be fair, Maxwell was uh tying everything together because our movie was everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, the everything bagel, the bagel that you put literally everything on. I was wondering why, when you first see the alternate universe, Jamie Lee Curtis, she has like a circle drawn on her forehead. And then she staples a paper with a circle drawn on it onto her forehead. And it's like, oh, shit. Okay, bagel. 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 That's why there are circles throughout the entire film. Uh, and I just want, before we leave, I just want to say, now get out the leeches, church organists. That's our new catchphrase, kids. <laughs> That's our new catchphrase. Start saying it. Start saying it in the, the playground. You know, R really make it catch on. Do, 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 do. Do 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 do. Get your hands off of my mouse, Eleanor. Do 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 do. Skitty bop a do wow. Cut and print. Cut on a cookie. That's a wrap. <laughs>